Hello, everyone. We are Amicus Brain. Amicus Brain Innovations uh, Incorporated is a digital health technology startup focused on bringing the power of artificial intelligence technology to transform care management for people living with neurodegenerative disorders. We are about making technology solutions available to everyone to reduce caregiver stressors, increase self-efficacy, and enable people living with dementia to remain at home longer. So today we bring you our Living Well with Dementia series, where we share stories by persons living with Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. Stories that provide a broader perspective on the realities of their lives and stories about how they continue to live meaningful lives. So we are today delighted to begin this series with a conversation with Peter Berry, who was diagnosed at the age of 50 with early onset Alzheimer's and Deb Bunt, a retired family practitioner and author of Peter's book, Slow Puncher. The event will be facilitated by our Amicus Brain advisor, Geeta Iyer. We will then conclude with a Q&A from all of you. And as you listen, please um, use the chat to share your experiences, make your comments, and um, raise questions. So now over to Geeta. Thank you, Sri, um, and thank you, Amicus Brain Innovations, for um, hosting this uh, important conversation. Thank you, Peter and Deb, um, for joining us today. Um, I have been really looking forward to this one um, for a long time. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier when we were chatting, uh, my father was diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's, but he was in his 90s, and I suddenly became his caregiver. Um, and uh, so one of the things that I used to do was seek support and um, information. And I used the social media quite extensively. I would uh, use Facebook support groups. And that's how I landed on the Peter Berry Living with Alzheimer's Facebook page. Um, I was um, really inspired and um, it was very eye-opening because um, I did not know that someone as young as 50 could get Alzheimer's. And more importantly, um, after Alzheimer's could live the way you do every day doing the things that you're passionate about. So we want to know more about it. And I'm so um, delighted uh, to be able to uh, see both of you and have a conversation. Um, so to start with uh, Peter, uh, would you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your life before the diagnosis? Yes, of course. Um, well, as you all know, my name is, is Peter Berry, and um, prior to being diagnosed with Alzheimer's, I ran a family timber business um, that my father started in 1947. Um, the ironic thing is he had to give the business up, um, basically because he developed uh, Alzheimer's, um, and I took the business from him, and uh, the whole thing sort of turned a bit full circle really because exactly the same thing happened to me. Uh, my father developed the condition in his uh, late 60s I suppose really and and he lived for 25, 26 years very well with the condition. Um, I was very close to my father and I didn't realize at that time that he had actually mastered the art of living well with dementia. Um, at that time, I didn't really understand um, what he was going through, but uh, with my own diagnosis and, and as time has gone on, I, I tend to see more through his eyes than I, than I did um, previous. So I'm married um, to my wife, Teresa, and we had one daughter, Kate, who is now, I think she's 26, I believe she is, and um, she is a, a hairdresser. So uh, life was, was pretty normal, pretty good. And um, yeah, it was just, um, just fun, really. So, um, Deb, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, say a little bit about uh, uh, yourself and also how you met uh, Peter? Yes, uh, so I'm Deb Bunt. And I used to live in London, uh, amongst many other places. 
and I lived there for about 15, 20 years working with families uh, where young people committed antisocial behaviour. And basically I'd had enough of that. So my husband and I upstairs and moved to Suffolk, which is on the east coast, <laughs> east coast of Britain. Um, and we took early retirement. Um, not really knowing what we were going to do and not really knowing anybody and not having any ties in this part of the world. And then a few days later, because we live in a very friendly town, I bumped into him, Peter, in a cycle shop and we got chatting and we started going out for bike rides and the relationship as a friendship developed and, and that's been three and a half years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Seems <laughs> You're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean that's wonderful. We'll we'll come back to your bike uh, biking um, expeditions uh, because that's been a very important part of um, uh, Peter's um, life. Um, so uh, Peter, you you don't expect to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's at fifty. Um, so what made you and uh, your family go to the doctor? You know for the diagnosis. So what was happening? Um, well, that made you down to my wife more than anything. Um, I think that, that people like me, we don't really see what's, what's going on. Um, and there is this idea that people with dementia are in denial of their own diagnosis. And I was very guilty of that at, at that time. Um, I had a very good memory for my work and, um, and my business. I had a very good head for, for figures. Um, and my whole business was based around calculations. And uh, that started to fail. Um, my memory started to fail, my short-term memory. And instead of keeping all the information in my head, I was starting to write things down, which was rather unusual for me. And my wife came into the office one day and I had little pieces of paper stuck all over the place with little um, memories on, uh, little notes on to remind me to do things. And she thought that something was obviously wrong. Um, I was quite happy. I just thought, well, I'm getting a little older. I had a lot going on and it was one of those things. And I think that in all fairness to people like myself, I think we design coping strategies over a period of time. So we don't always see the problems that, um, that we're, we're living with. It's those around us that, that tend to, to see those issues. So we went down the road of um, a diagnosis, various tests that they do here in England, memory tests and um, brain scans. And uh, yeah, we were told um, that um, I had early onset Alzheimer's, and uh, that was, I think, I think I was just just a little over fifty at, at that time. So, um, what was the impact? That must have been um, devastating. And um, I've heard the first year was also very difficult. Um, mm. That you even thought about suicide and um, depression. You went through depression. So, um, but here you are, I want to know how you came from there to here. <laughs> how well, there's this, <clears throat> this idea that, um, I mean, I was quite, I suppose, ignorant to dementia, even though my father uh, ha had had it for, for many years and was actually at that time still, still living and, um, and was obviously um, still a big part of, of my life. So I had an idea of dementia, but I didn't realise that um, uh, people at my age group could actually get a diagnosis of that. Um, it, was, it was a shock. It was a diagnosis for the family, not just for me. Um, I think that when the doctor actually said that we, we had uh, Alzheimer's, it was like the doctor dropped a pebble into the water and the ripples started to move out. And once those ripples start to go, there's, there's no stopping. For the first year, we decided to keep very quiet about our dementia. Um, I was embarrassed, I think, to be honest, that I had that condition. Um, I was worried about the future financially because 
people in my age group had financial commitments and work was becoming difficult um, to earn an income was becoming difficult. Um, I did have a pension and that is what I actually draw on now to live on. So I'm quite fortunate as far as that goes. Um, I, like most men, was the hub of the family. And I think that once the diagnosis happened, then I was no longer that hub. I had lost my sense of purpose. Um, not being able to drive, uh, not being able to, to, to run the business, not being able to provide. So it became a very, I suppose, dark place over a period of about 12 months. Um, and I came to the idea that in a very short space of time, I would be incapable of doing most things. And I think when you get to that stage in, in, in your life, you then you then think to yourself, well, what is the point in being here? So I did, uh, did go through a stage where I, you know, considered and got very close to taking my own life. It was actually at that point, I think the lowest point where I was in, in, in that time, that I realised that nobody was really helping us at that time. That things had changed a bit in, in England here now over the last few years, but we weren't being very well supported. Everything in England is geared up to people of an older generation with the, with the condition, uh, 65 plus. But people in my age group, there wasn't anything. And we were pretty much alone. And I come to realise that I knew what it was like to, to have this condition and be where I, where I was at that particular time which was really only seconds away from, from finishing it all. And I thought, well, there's all these other people who are being diagnosed, will be diagnosed, and will go through the same thing that us as a family and me as an individual are going through. I wonder if I could help those people. That, and I didn't realise at the time, was where the seed was then set for living well with dementia. I didn't realise it at the time, but that second, it gave me a sense of purpose, gave me something to live for, something to, I can do this. I have then become in control of something again. That's when we started to have this idea about educating others about the condition. And I came up with this idea about cycling across Britain as a, a, a challenge to show people that people with dementia, their life wasn't over, it was just different. We can still achieve things. And cycling has always been a big part of my life ever since I was in my early teens. So, I cycled across Britain to raise awareness and raise some money. That was, that, that was the first challenge that I did. And it was at that point that I then realized what living well with dementia was all about for me personally. And then we came up with the idea of, of educating others and doing a challenge every year. And, um, and now we go around, we do talks like this to, to educate people and to tell people and to get them to understand that, yes, a diagnosis is not a good thing, but you can still live with it. And with the precious time that we have left, do everything you want to do when you want to do it. That's... that's um... Powerful. I think it's a message for all of us um, uh, because no matter what it is, it could be dementia or it could be something else, um, you kind of refocused your energies uh, from what you were doing, you were able to do, and you, from the loss of independence, some of the, you know, not able to drive, etc., you found your purpose. You shifted them to other things that you could still do well and some of your other interests and uh, passions. And I think it's wonderful because it makes you live life more deeply. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and I think it's really noble and 
generous of you that you started thinking about helping other people in your shoes. Um, I think that's just wonderful. So um, the fact remains uh, from you know what I've heard in many of your videos. I've I've listened to many of your videos. Um, so even to make those videos, uh, I I think uh, you you were making a video every week, right? Um, um, you know, video number 28, 29, and you were like, uh, there were there are many of them, and you will just it was a candid, uh, open, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, talk about what you went through that week or whatever. So you would have needed help for that. So how do you do some of these things? Um, instead of saying I cannot do it, you did those things. How do you do those things? Well, um, I started to write everything down in a, in, in a diary. And um, after, as my dementia started to progress a little bit, I found writing very difficult. And it was my daughter who said to me, why don't you do a video, Dad, and um, put it on YouTube? Well, I had no idea how to do that. So she was the first one who helped me do a few of them. Um, I think I did over 200 in the end, and it was just really, a, as you say, a few minutes every Friday, and um, I just put them up, and I thought, well, maybe they might help somebody, maybe they won't, but they actually did help a, a, a lot of people. Um, over a period of time, they got very difficult to do, and um, I, I then couldn't do them, but um, I eventually, when I became friends with Debs, it then... We, we had a problem with the video, so we found a solution. Debs and, and her husband and my wife, they managed the page and um, the, um, the, 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 the Twitter account and all of that, all of that for me. Um, people like me with dementia, we can achieve many things, but we need a little bit of backup, a little bit of assistance to do that. And one of the sayings that I often use is that People like us, we can get to the end of our garden path, but we can't open the gate and we can't go any further. We need others to open that gate for us and help us go further. It's, um, it's not that I need care. It's just that I need a little assistance at times to do things. I mean, to be honest with you today, we're here talking to you. Um, because my short-term memory is, is, is quite poor now, um, I had uh, text messages this morning saying, be here at a certain time, you are talking to so-and-so. And I sort of rock up and, and, and I talk, and sometimes even before I get here, I have no idea who I'm talking to, but I know what I'm talking about. So without that assistance, then I, I wouldn't be able to move forward. So it's support from family and friends, which is, which is key to living well with dementia. Yeah, I think uh, you bring up a very important point, uh, the willingness to accept help, mm -hmm. because you, um, you know that you need help with a few things. Uh, there are many things you can do on your own, and I think that, is, that applies to all of us, to know when we need help and ask for it. So Deb, uh, men uh, you mentioned to me that you're not a carer and that you're equals. Um, can you elaborate on that? Because uh, I think Peter just touched on that as well. Yeah, I, I think we are equals in terms of our friendship, obviously, um, intellectually, much, much more <laughs> equal, much superior to you. But <laughs> the things I can do and I can't do seems to tally with the things that Peter can't do and he can do. So we do a lot of cycling together. Now, I couldn't do that on my own because I do know one end of a bike from another, but I can't, I can't pump a tyre, I can't change a puncture, I can't do anything associated with the mechanics of the bike. Equally, I have no sense of direction. So if Peter wasn't with me, I would just go round and round in a circle on a bike with a flat tyre probably. So, so Peter's support for me is key for me to do what I want to do. <clears throat> and I suppose I support Peter in that, I, I'm, I'm, because I know him pretty well, I know when he might be hungry and remind him, maybe we should have something to eat. I know roughly what he likes to eat, so I don't overwhelm Peter with, what do you want? But I say, should we have a scone? Knowing that he likes a scone. So it's about knowing what Peter does like, <clears throat> which enables me to support him, and his abilities and everything else enables him to support me. So it is equal, 
Um, and it's, it's quite a remarkable friendship, really. I think it is. And I think it's, it, it's something that um, just evolved somehow. It, we, we, we didn't really work at the, um, at the friendship. It just, it just happened. And it, it's great because, to give you an example, I'm here today doing this. My wife um, has gone out for a, a quick solo cycle ride this morning. You see, I have this dementia monster that I get away from, and my wife has a dementia monster, and that's me. She needs to get away from me. But she also needs to have the, the peace of mind that she hasn't got to think about um, what's she doing. Um, because if, if she goes out and I'm on my own, I, I forget where she is, and there's this constant communication. But if I'm with Deb, she trusts Deb, she trusts Deb's family, and it's just, she can just get away from her dementia and she can be herself. And, as, and, and that's important to focus on the people who, I suppose, care for us and live with us. Um, a lot of the time, the focus is on the person with dementia. But people like me don't suffer with dementia. The people around me suffer with dementia. They see all my failings. Uh, they see everything that I do wrong. I don't. It's just, it's just gone. I'm, I'm just looking straight ahead. But um, uh, people around me see everything else. And it's sometimes important for those people to live their lives and uh, away from dementia. And uh, Dent is, is part of that key that, that, that unlocks, unlocks that box for us. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty huge because I wish I had heard this before I, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's because I didn't know I couldn't understand why a lot of things were happening. And a lot of our responses come from that place of not knowing, you know. Um, um, so I think um, I saw a video of yours, um, which was made by Being Patient and a seven minute video, very well made, uh, made video. And Deb told me there are many videos about you. And when we, um, one of my friends uh, remarked to me that he doesn't look like he has Alzheimer's. So people think of people with Alzheimer's are a certain way. Do you get that a lot? That um, I cannot believe this. My, my father um, uh, had dementia for over, over 20 years, Alzheimer's, and um, we used to go up to the local town. I used to go and see him regularly. We'd walk up to the local town, and he would have conversations with people, people who have known my father for many years, 40, 50 years, and they would say to me, there's nothing wrong with Jim. He's perfectly all right. Now, there was nothing wrong with my father physically. He was a very fit, um, a well-respected man. He was upright and he was, dare I say, a dapper, good-looking chap. And to look at him, you would think that he was the perfect elderly gentleman. But his memory, like mine, was, was so poor. Um, we would have a conversation with people in the town. Um, they would say, he's okay. I would say, yes. We would walk away two minutes, and he had no knowledge of even seeing them or, or talking to them. His memory had got that bad. So people's perception of dementia is very different to the, the reality of dementia. Uh, people think that it's elderly people in care homes. Um, because somebody is physically fit and able to do things, then, you know, and we can talk, we, have a, we can have a conversation, then we don't have dementia. And, and that's the thing that we try to educate to people, that there is dementia, is, is, it, it can be a hidden disability. Um, none of us go about with big Ds written on our head, you know, <laughs> so it's, um, but I mean, Debs will, will, will probably give you many instances where um, people like me, we tend to have these coping strategies and we tend to um, be showmen. You don't get uh, dementia on Monday and you're diagnosed on Tuesday afternoon. It takes many years to get a diagnosis. So over that time, we learn to cope as individuals and we take that coping 
mechanism right the way through to probably the later stages of dementia. And you can quite easily fool people that you are normal without dementia very easily. And sometimes I do that on purpose because I think, yes, they don't think I've got dementia. That's one to me and zero to dementia, you know, because uh, it can be very <laughs> embarrassing to, to forget things. It can be very embarrassing to not follow a conversation. And if you're not careful, we can be alienated and, and, and put in the corner because nobody will speak to the person with dementia because they won't understand anyway. So you try and blag it to keep in, in with the crowd. Well, that's, that's what I do personally. And that's what my father did. And I learned over the years with my father that dementia is an extremely complicated condition. But it is surrounded by simplicity. What so many people do is they dive into the complicated mess of dementia and try and work out what uncle, auntie, husband, wife is thinking. Why are they saying this? Why are they doing that? But in actual fact, if they just stood back a little bit and dealt with the simple part of dementia, it makes the complicated part so much less complicated. If I go for a cycle ride with Debs, my wife doesn't ask me, where did you go today? She says, did you have a good ride? Yes. The complicated part of dementia is where did I go? I've got to try and work it all out. Mm -hmm. And I very often don't know. The simple part is, did you have a good ride? Yes, I did. Because I feel it here and I don't think it here. And I learned yes. that with my father. Yes, uh, that is a lesson I, I had to learn as well with my, my own dad, um, you know, and um, I'm going to ask uh, Deb this question, and I think I'll come back to Peter as well. Uh, this question about, um, you know, we talked about people starting a sentence with remember, I told you, um, and you mentioned earlier when you would go on these rides with Peter, you would uh, make it simple about uh, reminding him about his lunch. Um, it was the same with my dad too. I, I, I would tell my mom, don't, he would get confused if she asked him, what do you want to have for breakfast today? Do you want this, this, this? And she would give him four choices and he would get, he would have this look on his face and you know, it was like, it was a very complex puzzle. So I would tell her, make it simple uh, and easy for him. So I think it sounded like what you were doing was, you know that he likes this. And there's generally, these are the few things he eats. Um, is that other, is, is that what you were, um, you meant when you when you said that? Yes, I think so. I mean, I've learned that as I've you know got to know Peter better, and I've learned about how to approach his particular dementia. It, it may not be that that would work for any other person, but I, I know enough about Peter to know in the morning he likes coffee, in the afternoon he likes tea. So I might say latte or, or um, white coffee. So Peter still has a choice, but I'm not going to give him a list of five different coffees or five different teas because there is no point. And that's something Peter has taught me. Not, not you haven't sat down and given me a lecture. You've, you've just kind of embedded it into my thought mm. by how you are. Um, and also starting a sentence with, oh, do you remember the other day? We all do it. There is no point in saying, do you remember? I still do do it, but there is no point. So it's about thinking how to phrase a sentence in a way that will remind Peter that something has happened without embarrassing you that you don't remember. Quite often he just says yes anyway, and I know he hasn't remembered because he can't blag me. <laughs> it's about rethinking how we might phrase a question. And we all do it. We all say, oh, do you remember the other day? Do you remember this morning, Peter? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I, uh, this, this is a good point that Deb's raised, actually. I'm talking to you here now, and since we've been talking, I have lost the, um, the, the memory of who you are, where you are. You're just a nice person that I'm talking to. Deb's has put a note down on here, but it, it just goes from my mind. It, 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 it really does. And these are the things that people don't see and, and sometimes don't quite understand. And I just wing it most of the time and, and pretend that I know what's going on because it, 
it somehow is easier for other people. Whether that's the right way or the wrong way to do it, I don't know. But um, but I just and and the reality is that I will leave Debs today and, and go home, and and I will very shortly forget that we have we have had this this uh, this interview, this this conversation, um, and that's. That's sad in a way, but um, uh, but this is the, getting back to the whole point of we we must focus on the living well. My father used to say, Peter, he said, I, I focus on the things I can do. He said, I don't worry about the things I can't. <laughs> yeah. But I think, and well, I think we'll go. To, to understand Peter's memory and the extended memory, and for me to change how I word things or interact with you. Mm. I think it is a two-way process because otherwise it, it, it's just not a friendship, is it? It's constantly me being a carer and I'm not your, God forbid, <laughs> I'm not your carer. So it's really important that people who have friends with dementia understand them. Yes, yeah. And I think that um, we often look at large organisations, or we, we do in this country, we look at large organisations for advice and, and care on our loved ones with dementia. But in actual fact, that is, is closer to home than, than we actually think because people, professional people come in, they know that person with dementia at that time. Now, with someone like my father, I'd known my father obviously all my life, so I knew the man before dementia. Sometimes I would go and see my father in a care home. He got no idea who I was. He would say, well, who are you then? And I would come up with the, the idea, oh, I was just walking past your room. I thought you were a nice chap to have a chat with. You don't mind if I sit down and have a chat? Oh, no, sit down. And we would have a conversation. And I would talk to him about his past because I knew his past. That's something that a carer couldn't do. We would laugh. We would joke. I would go away, a couple of days later I would come back and he knew exactly who I was. I didn't sit there and keep saying to my father, I'm your son, I'm Peter, because that confused him and he didn't need to know that because I knew I was his son, so it didn't matter. I was just the guy who made him laugh at that time and we got on okay. So. A carer couldn't do that, and I think that's that's an, an important fact. Again, that's all part of living well with dementia for him. That was the, the part of me just being some bloke who happened to come in. We had a good three quarters of an hour chat. He laughed, and after I was gone, he couldn't remember it, but he felt it. And that's a great point that um, you know a lot of. Caregivers, I know they struggle with this loss of recognition. Uh, I experienced that too. But after a point, it doesn't matter. It didn't matter that my dad did not know me. I know him. But uh, another point is feelings. It's we have uh, the memory of feelings. Of uh, So he always knew that, okay, this is how it feels to be comforted and loved. And so uh, that you can provide that, that is, uh, that is still powerful, right? Yeah. Um, so um, one of the, I, I like, uh, you know, the humor in many of your videos. And uh, I think pe a lot of people living with dementia have seen they use humor. Uh, has that helped you, you know, just being able to, I've already seen that in our conversation, you know, be able to laugh at some of the frailties that we have, right? Um, I think that also helps. I think in order for us, Personally, as, as people with dementia, for, it, for us to, to cope better, or for me personally, I found that taking the mickey out of my dementia, out of myself, somehow lightens the, the dark diagnosis a little bit. Um, sometimes when I forget things, me and my wife, we have quite a giggle about it, or she will make a point of, of saying something that just is, is humorous about dementia because because we're a family living with it we can take the mickey out of it because we're allowed to do that that's that's how it how it works and i think that 
being able to laugh at ourselves and our own failings sometimes is is a good thing. It, it definitely lightens the mood a little bit. Um, yeah. I still have days where I where I find it very difficult to cope with the condition because the condition changes. Um, uh, it evolves over time, and 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 I know this. Um, uh, to give you an example, I'm I'm having difficulty now with um, with with walking and going up and down stairs. Um, if I look at my feet or I look at my hands, the information is is better for my brain to cope with it. But if I'm not looking, my brain doesn't connect with other bits of my body. So I find those things difficult to accept. Um, but then again. Dementia is a moving target, and it is difficult to hit. But if we can hit it on occasions, and uh, and just have a, a laugh and be a little bit lighthearted about it, then it, it somehow does make it a bit more livable. I'll put it that way. So um, you know, we all need a support system, and uh, for we always we, we have a lot of caregiver support groups. Um, so you do have your support system in Deb and your wife, your daughter. Um, do you also have a support uh, group of peers of other people who are in your shoes who are going through the same experience? Yes, yes and no. Um, I think um, locally we don't as such, even though um, I think things are starting to change. Most of the groups are set up for people who are further down the journey of, of dementia. And people like me don't go to them groups because it's like looking at the future and it can be very depressing. But I was a member of um, a television program here in England called The Restaurant That Makes Mistakes. And it was, I think it was 14 of us, all with different types of dementia. And um, we got together and, and ran a restaurant for a, a number of weeks. Um, that was great. And that we are still... Um, in communication with each other now, most of us. So every month we have a Zoom meeting and um, we talk to each other on, on text messages and that sort of thing. So we do have a support group together with that, um, peer support. And that's actually become more important than, um, than I don't think any of us actually realised. We all thought that we would go in, do this programme for X amount of months, go away and not see each other. But We've actually made some lifelong friends um, through that. And uh, some people's dementia has, has changed them. Some people have stayed the same. But there's still a group of us who do these um, support meetings. And, and that's, that's, that's pretty good. We have other people set the Zooms up for us. And, um, yeah, we just have a half an hour where we just talk a load of old rubbish and have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I happened to uh, attend a meeting last week, um, coincidentally. Um, it was a meeting uh, of people living with dementia. And the topic was how to find joy and laughter when you're living with dementia. So I was the, um, um, I was not, uh, I, I had to introduce myself as someone who doesn't have dementia, but I'm learning, I'm learning from you. Um, so it was a very interesting discussion. They let me into the meeting and, um, I, you know, I was, uh, there were people at different levels of, um, of uh, dementia, and, uh, but they're capable of doing many things. And there was a lot of humor. There was a lot of laughter. And they talked about the different coping mechanisms, um, you know, that they resort to, uh, to live well with dementia. So that was, uh, and one of them mentioned that they love these meetings because here they are, uh, everybody is in the same uh, boat and uh, everybody's going through a similar experience. So that is, um, that's why I thought I would bring that up. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the dementia monster? I know you alluded to, um, it, uh, you refer to a dementia, the dementia monster quite a bit in uh, many of the videos. What is that? Oh, well, I, I have, um, I have a little, little picture here. Of ah, that's, in the that's how it looks like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I am um, the nasty little beast. <laughs> I found it difficult to, um, I suppose, to to deal with dementia in in my head because it wasn't a thing. It was just in there. 
Um, it, it wasn't like having a broken finger or a broken arm. You couldn't physically see what was there. Um, so in order to, to, to deal with it, I decided to make it a thing. And I thought, well, I'll make it a, a grumpy little monster with a, with, a, with a pointy nose and a little drip on his nose. <laughs> and he's always very grumpy and he's in charge and he's, he's going to in control. And I had idea that if I made it a thing, I could deal with it better. Mm -hmm. um, and my dementia monster is in charge when I'm at home. He's sitting there on the settee, on the sofa beside me, and he's, he's there, he's in control of my life. When I get on a bicycle and I go out, I leave him at home. So he's not in control anymore. I'm not Peter with dementia, I'm, I'm Peter on the bike. And my dementia monster is very grumpy and he's upset because I'm doing what I want. He's, he's not in control. And when I come back after a, a, a morning's ride, then I, I visualize him sitting there twiddling his thumbs and, and I get back and I can cope with him better because I, I've had my time away from my dementia. And, uh, I can just cope with him better. And I like to see him looking grumpy, you know, because I've, I've been out. And that's just the way that, that yeah. I sort of have learned to cope with it. Just a little something. And that's that beautiful. I... That's beautiful because if, when he, and uh, hilarious in a way, because uh, when he is grumpy, you're happy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, and you have realized that you can, you have the power to make him grumpy, right? You, when you've externalized him, um, you, for moments of time and you can just leave him behind and um, I also like that he's a man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought if, if, if you made him into a lady that wouldn't be quite right somehow, that wouldn't work. But, <laughs> but again, it's, it's, you, would it's have all, other pro you would have other problems. I would. It's all part of of the complicated dementia and the simple part again. I, I made it simple by having something that I could physically deal with rather than, than trying to deal with the mess that was going on inside my head and, and trying to understand it. So, uh, yeah. Yeah.